Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, welcome to Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Today, we have a story to tell, and it happens to involve this little guy. Oh, that's just the centrifuge just finished. Happens to involve this little guy. For those of you who don't know him, this is George. George is an English toy spaniel, and he's 15 and a half years old. We adopted George when he was about a year and a half old, and he came from a very large puppy mill in West Virginia. So he was meant to be a breeding dog uh, at this puppy mill. The puppy mill got closed down. And interestingly, the puppy mill was owned by a man who had the top English toy spaniels and I believe papillons uh, at Westminster. And then he kind of lost his mind and decided that 500 dogs was better than 10 dogs. And uh, he got turned in and closed down, thankfully. And George got released to what I consider to be a wonderful life. So he came through Lucky Star Cavalier Rescue because they are one of the Cavalier Rescues who are willing to also uh, rescue and adopt English toy spaniels. And the, as much as I love the Cavaliers, the English toys really have my heart. And so we also have Gabby, who's an English toy spaniel. She's our Ruby. And we also just adopted Gilmore, who is a Blenheim English toy spaniel, who also came from a breeding slash hoarding situation. So We've had George since he was a year and a half old, and uh, he had really severe dry eye when we adopted him. And I was, so it was 14 years ago, and I was pretty early in my holistic career and my TCVM career. And um, I decided that when we got George, that I could cure his dry eye by making a diet for him. And so the dry eye diet that you've seen published in my books and on our website was designed originally for George. And it's gone through a few iterations. Um, I like the current iteration the best, but even the original one that I used that was in the first book from Needles to Natural, it solved George's problem. And within three months, he was able to be taken off of all of his dry eye medications. At that time, he was on cyclosporin with blech. Um, now I much prefer tacrolimus in MCT oil, but he was able to be taken off all his medications and his dry eye was completely healed just with a diet change. So that right there showed me the power of food therapy and I was really, really hooked. So little George being an English toy spaniel has a lot of the problems that we see in the breed. He has comms, which is caudal occipital malformation syndrome, where the back of the skull presses into the brainstem. Um, and part of the brainstem is on the outside of the skull. Uh, he also has SM, which is syringomyelia, which are fluid pockets in the spinal cord. And some of his are actually fairly low down on his spine. So sometimes he'll chew at his sides. Um, he also has intervertebral disc disease in his neck. Uh, he's had a couple of MRIs. That's how we, we have proof of what has happened with him. Uh, the first MRI he had because we came home one night and he was screeching in pain, which was secondary to the discs in his neck, the comms and the SM. Uh, got him through that episode. And then a couple of years later, he developed paralysis of the left side of his head and face. So his tongue hangs out on the side, his lip is drawn up. He cannot blink. He's a black dog, so it's impossible to see on camera, but he can't blink his left eye. And that's been going on for at least five years. Um, and so the problem with not being able to blink is that he can't spread tear film across his eye. So it's basically the same as having dry eye, um, even though he does produce tears, he can't spread them across the eye surface. So for the past five years, I have been, well, me, my mom, everybody, we've been putting drops in his eyes multiple times a day. So he is back on tacrolimus because I want to make sure he also has a little bit of panis, which is a black film that will uh, grow across the eye when it dries. Um, and because he can't blink, he does have some drying of the cornea. So we use hyaluronic acid eye drops. We use an antibiotic eye drop because he also developed MRSA in both of his eyes from the chronic issues. Um, so we're on about our fourth different antibiotic drop, but it's keeping it very well under control. Um, so he has the tacrolimus, the hyaluronic acid eye drops, and his antibiotic eye drop. Um, he doesn't see great, but he sees enough to get around. So we're very happy with that. He's 15 and a half years old now. He's 
mostly deaf. He hears some things, like if we clap loudly, he hears that. Uh, if we get really excited and call him and, you know, loud and animated, he hears that as well. So a few months ago, um, George started doing a lot more panting. And his tongue, um, Joey, for Facebook and Instagram, we can put that picture up. His tongue became this dark, toxic red. Um, well, you stop panting now, so Instagram isn't going to see it. But <laughs> good for you for not panting for a minute. Um, so his in Chinese medicine, we use tongue color to tell us a lot. And there is a darkness that occurs um, when we have a deep-seated heat problem within the body. So a few months ago, I started saying, George, there, there's the good one. George, your tongue is toxic red something toxic is going on inside this dog. And I took him in in February of this year to have a dental cleaning done. Uh, we did lab work and chest x-rays prior to that because he also has mitral valve disease. He's not on medications for that, but he, he is uh, stage B2 with a grade five murmur. So he's not on medications. We manage that with diet and supplements. And so before his dental in February, he had lab work, which was pretty normal. Kidney values were good. His BUN was a little bit high, but nothing that was concerning at all. And everything else looked great. And his chest x-ray looked great. So we said, okay, that's awesome. He's had two echocardiograms done and doesn't need medication. He's also had annual abdominal ultrasounds because he has a history of stomach ulcers because he's our little nervous Nelly because he's, he's kind of low man on the totem pole. Um, so when the toxic tongue showed up, I said, hmm, something is going on with this guy and I don't know what it is. Well, all of his lab work came back fine. His chest x-ray came back fine. This is when it becomes a search and destroy. What is going on? Where is this toxic heat coming from? He also started, he's on a raw diet. So he's a very high moisture diet. He started drinking more. And I said, he's trying to put out the fire. There's a fire in this dog somewhere. Now our boys wear piddle wraps in the house. Um, Forrest is not neutered. He's a young boy and he still likes to mark. George has always been really good, but he started having accidents. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to wrap you to maybe you're having accidents because Forrest is having accidents. And then about a month ago, I started finding little pea spots in the house. And we couldn't tell. Now, Charlie, if you remember our Cocker Spaniel that we adopted in January has some small oxalate bladder stones. So we're keeping an eye on that. They're not bad enough that he needs surgery at this point. But my question at the time, when I was finding these little urine spots, I was putting dipsticks in them and they had traces of blood, red blood cells, but the pH was low. So not an infection. And I thought, well, okay, Charlie's having little accidents from these stones. Maybe they're trying to pass. Um, couldn't really tell what was going on. And so this went on for a few weeks and finally we figured out that we thought it was George who was leaving the little piddle spots, like when he didn't have a wrap on. And we also noticed that George would be standing in the house and you can tell when he's peeing, he just, he doesn't lift a leg. He just stands in the middle of the room. The tail comes up and the body kind of does this. And I said, Oh, he's getting senile. He's peeing in his wrap. Like, I don't think he understands where he is. Well, we started putting all these pieces together. And finally I said, you know what? I think this is George's urine and I think it's got traces of blood in it and that's not normal. And we need to figure out what's going on. So first thing I did is I took in a urine sample. So it took quite a few days to get the urine from him because when I go near him with a cup, he runs the other way. <laughs> Uh, so the urinalysis came back with slightly concentrated urine. So that's good. The kidneys are still doing their thing. Normal pH, tons of what the dipstick was reading was white blood cells and red blood cells. So I said, okay, let's drop off a sample. And when I dropped off the sample, they came up with the same exact thing. Lots of white cells, lots of red cells and epithelial cells, which are the cells that line the bladder wall. And I said, oh boy, this is not good at all. So my veterinarian called me with the results and she said, well, it looks like he might have an infection because we have red and white blood cells. And I said, it's not an infection. The pH is normal. 
not an infection. I'm really concerned he may have a tumor in his bladder. So I said, I want to schedule him for an ultrasound uh, as soon as possible. Good boy. So she agreed to do that. In the meantime, we got lab work on George. So we did a complete CBC and chemistry and thyroid panel. Good boy. You want to get down? You can get down now. You're such a good boy. There you go. Go play. Um, so we got his lab results back. Red cell count normal. White cell count normal. Normal distribution. Platelets very mildly high. 464,000 normals up to 448,000. All that tells me is there's a little bit of inflammation somewhere. Woohoo. On his lab results, his SDMA, which is kidney function, came up at 16, which it had been a year ago. And then it dropped down to 12 in February. It's back up to 16. Cut off is 14. That doesn't bother me at all. Creatinine for kidney function, 0.9, perfectly normal. So I know that his kidneys are doing what they need to do. BUN was elevated at 44. Well, could be that he's on a high protein raw diet. Still not concerned. I know he's not in kidney failure. The rest of his lab results are normal, except for his ALKFAS, which is a nonspecific enzyme that can come from steroids, from the bone marrow, which I knew it wasn't that, or from the liver. His other liver enzymes are perfectly normal, and his ALKFAS is 203, normal's up to 160. Again, nothing earth shattering. I'm like, okay. Oh, and creatine kinase, uh, 295, normal's up to 200. Well, that's a muscle enzyme. He's got muscle wasting, he's losing weight, um, and he has a heart problem. So, Slightly high CPK, pfft, no big deal. So again, I've got lab work, and this happens so often. I've got lab work that doesn't give me a real answer. So I knew that the next step that I needed was an ultrasound. So our local veterinarian, Dr. Foka, who I had on about a month ago, um, she said, yeah, no problem. I'll get the guy here. And she got him in. It's a traveling ultrasonographer who has done three ultrasounds on George before. And so when I went in with him in the morning, I said, I do not want him sedated. We've got something going on. Plus his tongue doesn't work very well with the paralysis. And every time he gets sedated, it takes him about three days to figure out how to work his tongue again. So I said, I do not want sedation. And the traveling ultrasonographer who was in the back of the hospital refused to come out and talk to me. And so I kept making this poor technician go back and forth and back and forth. And I said, I want to talk to him. I do not want sedation on this dog. And here are all of my reasons. He's got heart disease. I think we might have a cancer going on. His tongue doesn't work after sedation. I, he's so good. I'll be happy to hold him. I will, if you can't do the ultrasound because he wiggles or misbehaves, I will pay you for the ultrasound, even if I don't get results, but I don't want him sedated. And his answer was, nope, not going to do it without sedation. And so the poor technician was fit to be tied because she's like, it's not our policy, it's his. And I said, I don't care whose policy it is. Somebody needs to talk to me about this. And he would not come out and talk to me. So being the parent who is in charge of my child's well-being, I said, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm leaving. And so I left in tears because I knew I needed an ultrasound and I couldn't get an answer. Um, and I also was crying tears of anger because this was a professional who was not willing to speak with another professional and was, so I, I get it guys. I understand your frustration when you go in, Gwen's dog was scheduled for an ultrasound the same day. And she said she didn't want sedation and he wouldn't do it without sedation. Her dog's 80 pounds. Uh, so she just agreed to the sedation for her dog. Um, but that's the choice that you make. So I was angry that I couldn't even have a conversation as a professional, but even as a pet parent. So you as pet parents without initials behind your name have even more trouble because they don't want to listen to you. I mean, he didn't want to listen to me. So I was angry. So I went home and I said, well, let me uh, hit the internet and find a specialty practice. Now, for those of you who've been following me, you know how much trouble we had finding a specialty practice to pin the cat's leg when he broke his leg because it was a Friday morning. Um, so this was a Tuesday. So I thought, oh my gosh, here I go. I'm going to be calling 20 different hospitals to find somebody who will do an ultrasound on this dog without sedation. And I don't understand the whole sedation thing because in my practice in New Jersey, we never sedated unless your animal was just a screaming maniac. 
never did we sedate for an ultrasound. So I called a practice about 30 minutes from home, a specialty center. And we had taken mittens there when we first moved down here and he had torn his uh, cruciate. And they were very nice. And I thought, well, let's give them a try. And I called and I spoke to the receptionist and, and explained my problem and my position. And I said, um, is, is your doctor willing to do this without sedation? And she said, I don't know. We usually do sedate. I'll find out. And I gave them the same deal. I said, I will bring him. I will hold him if you want me to. And if you can't get it and you, you, if you've spent time on it and you can't get it, I'll pay you anyway. I, you know, this is a $500 deal. I'll pay you anyway. I want you to try. And they called me back and said, we can get you in tomorrow morning. So within 24 hours, I was in first thing in the morning. And we took George in and uh, the doctor came out and had a conversation with me. And I explained my position and why I did not want him sedated. And she said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I understand that. And she said, well, let me go do a physical exam on him. Um, and, you know, I'll get right back to you. Okay. So she took him into this physical exam. She came back out. She said, oh my gosh, his heart with that murmur, there's no way I would sedate this dog. We're going to try it without. I said, okay, he's very good. And I'll hold him if you need me to. She said, no, no, that's fine. So Hugh and I hung out in the waiting room and about 45 minutes later, she came out. She said, we're all done. No sedation. Uh, he was really good. And I said, of course he was. I, I told you, you know, and of course we all think that our pets are wonderful and well-behaved, except he is. And I know he is. So uh, she came out and she got us and talked to us and um, showed me ultrasound pictures. And so on Facebook uh, and YouTube, you'll be able to see them. I, I don't have images that I can hold up. Um, so this one is his, and she said, you're right. There is a mass in the bladder, which, you know, I pretty much had the diagnosis in my head. I knew in my gut what this was going to be. Um, I just needed proof. Do you have the other ultrasound images too, Joey? Okay, so there we go. So what we actually found in George's bladder were five tumors, not one, five. Um, and they're all they're down at the opening of the bladder where it opens into the urethra to leave the body. And that is usually where transitional cell carcinomas are. Unfortunately, <coughs> transitional cell carcinomas do not usually have multiple tumors. Now, this has been going on for a while. I would say less than a year because he had an ultrasound a year ago of his abdomen and we didn't see anything. Um, so do transitional cell carcinomas become multiples if they're there long enough? Um, I don't know, but I, I am too scared to make it angry. Uh, I don't want to stick a catheter up there. I don't want to stick a needle into it. Um, I am doing everything I can to try to manage this without um, making the tumor angry. So, and George, by the way, has no idea that he's sick, so we haven't told him. He's asleep. He can't hear me anyway. Uh, we haven't told him. He's running around playing like a fool. Uh, he now gets lunch along with breakfast and dinner because I'm trying to put a little bit of weight back on him. And we've added a whole array. Of these My guys are always on mushroom supplements. They're always on omega-3s. But we've added a whole array of other things to his regimen to try to at least keep this thing at bay. Um, we're far enough advanced and we have so many tumors. I, I'm my goal is not to kill the cancer. My goal is not to cure the cancer. My goal is if I could hold it status quo, I'd be thrilled because he's still able to urinate. And that is what will be an endpoint if he can't urinate. Um, so, and they also found uh, some nodules on his liver. They don't think those are cancerous, and that's probably the explanation for the slightly elevated alkaline phosphatase. So um, we don't know. And so I contacted Dr. Kendra Pope in New Jersey, who is a board-certified oncologist and TCVM practitioner, and she wanted me to do a whole bunch of testing because she wants to know um, his iron levels, his vitamin D levels, which he's always been on a vitamin D supplement, so probably okay, but we'll find out. Um, and a whole bunch of other things. So we're doing a bunch of testing, uh, which hopefully can help direct our treatments a little bit. Um, but this is, this is the frustration of medicine, and this is why we call it practice. 
I, my gut told me what was going on, but I had to have proof to be able to, to do anything. Um, the urine was, there were no cancer cells seen in that urine sample epithelial cells, but no cancer cells seen. Well, clearly there's lumps and bumps in his bladder. So, um, and his lab work is really pretty pristine. So a lot of times the comangiosarcoma dogs, unless the tumor is bleeding and they've collapsed, you'll get perfectly normal lab work with a huge tumor in there. So it's very frustrating. And that's why the abdominal ultrasounds can be so critical, but trying to find an ultrasonographer these days who is, and this, this all came from COVID. This all came from people being locked out of the building and doctors not having enough help. And they said, well, if I sedate the dog, the dog just lays there. It takes one person to do the ultrasound versus if the dog is squiggly wiggly, it might take two people to hold the dog and one person to do the ultrasound. So that's a three person ordeal instead of a one person ordeal. I get it. But is it in the best interest of our pets to automatically sedate them when they've got heart disease, possible cancer? you know, possible liver disease, kidney disease, whatever they have going on. Um, and I, I think that we need a more humane and compassionate way of dealing with these things. So I really didn't want to come on to have everybody feel bad about George because we don't feel bad about George because George is still racing around the house and playing with the puppies, by the way, the puppies, the two-year-olds. Um, they were, they were all having a wrestling match last night. So George is fine. He thinks he's fine. And hope, he, I told him he had to live to be 27 and we're only at 15 and a half. So, you know, we got a little ways to go. Um, <clears throat> but the real reason I wanted to have this conversation was to talk about sticking up for your pets, going with your gut, insisting on lab work, when you know there's something and being persistent when you know there's something not right you know there's something going on keep looking until you find that something um, and find somebody that's willing to work with you in the best manner for your pet like literally if i had had to put george in the car and drive him back to new jersey to get an ultrasound unsedated that was my next step i got lucky i found somebody a half hour away and they were very compassionate and extremely wonderful so, um, anyway, for those of you in this area, it was Points East Veterinary Specialty Hospital uh, in Wilson, North Carolina. Uh, really great group there. Really great group. Um, okay, everybody have a wonderful weekend. Supporters, 7 o'clock tonight, we will see you. <coughs> I'll be having a cup of tea because I got a throat thing going on. Thank you, Gwen. <laughs>